Friend, good morning and welcome to our church service. It's wonderful to have you and if you're joining us online, a special welcome to you. I'm glad you could join us. We are continuing with our series in the book of Titus. So if you will please keep Titus chapter 2 verses 1 to 8 open. We will be working our way through those eight verses this morning. Last Sunday, our dear brother, Reverend Jeremiah, we're going to rev him till he gets used on the fact that he is a reverend now. He took us through Titus chapter 1, verse 10 to 16, under the title, Why Godly Leaders? Why do we need godly elders in the church of God? And the answer to that, which was part of the title, is to silence false teachers. Today we are in Titus 2, verse 1 to 8, under the title, The Senior, The Younger, and The Teacher. In this passage, God is addressing the whole church in their various group. I wish everybody was here to hear what God has to say to his church. But anyway, you're here. You needed to be here. I'm here so that I can hear what the Lord has to say to us as a whole. But before we dig into the word of God, let us bow our head in prayer and ask God to help us. Father God, we, we thank you for who you are. You are a loving God. You first loved us while we were your enemies and you sent the Lord Jesus to die for us. Teach us how to love you and help us to listen to your word obediently. We ask that you will magnify and glorify yourself as we listen to you speaking the words of life to us. We pray this in the strong name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Having reviewed the qualifications of elders and their responsibilities, Paul exhorted Titus to speak these things or to speak the things which are in accord with sound doctrine. And that's what you do in the church. You open the Bible Sunday in and Sunday out in our Bible studies. And you allow the Bible to set the agenda and to speak. The leader or the preacher or the leader of the service. We're just initiating meeting between us and God. And as we open his word, God is speaking to all of us, including the preacher. Things that are in accord with sound doctrine. That's the Bible. And such things include proper conduct expected of Christians, both male and female, young and old, And those who are servants, even Titus was to present himself as a pattern of good works for others to follow, which will also serve to silence those who oppose him. And these things, Titus, is to teach them with all authority, allowing no one to despise him for doing so. 
There is one main point that I would like to make. I can hear the sigh, the sigh of relief from the congregation. <laughs> one point, of course, I'm going to stretch it so that we understand what the Bible is to teach us this morning. And that point is no retirement allowed. That's a good slogan to put it on the doorpost of the church. So when you come in, you know that in the church of God, no retirement is allowed. When you go out after the service, you are reminded that no retirement is allowed in the church. I know some of you worked hard when you were young so that you could retire well. But in the church of God, retirement is not allowed as we're going to see what Paul has to say to Timothy, to Titus, sorry. So if you didn't know that retirement is not allowed in the church, now you do. No retirement allowed in the church. Titus 2 deals with what we might call the Christian character in action. It takes people in the church by their various ages and groups and lay down what they ought to be in the church and in the world. And it begins with the older man. The Bible so, is written so beautifully. We've been looking at the elders and the godliness that is, uh, is expected of them. Now this section begins with older men because elders are chosen from among older men. Listen to what verse 1 and 2 says. But as for you, teach what accords with the sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and steadfastness. So here in verse 1, Titus, as a teacher, Paul says to him, you must teach things that are in line with the Bible. Nothing more, nothing less. He is to teach things that are sound doctrine. The word sound literally means to be well and to be in good health. Sound doctrine is therefore that which is spiritually healthy and wholesome as opposed to junk teaching. Titus must teach older men to be sober-minded, dignified, and self-controlled. That means great beards of the flock, as Stott calls them, must display a conduct that is both fitting to their seniority and expressive of their inner self-control. That's a vivid picture of older men in the church. They mature, they carry themselves in a dignified manner, and they display self-control as they live for Jesus. He must also teach older men to be sound in faith, love, and steadfastness. That is, they must show maturity in their trust in God and brotherly affection expressed in serving one another. So in a way, no retirement is allowed in the church. It doesn't matter how old you are, you are expected to serve others in every way in the church of God. They are to do that as they wait patiently for the fulfillment of their Christian hope. 
a requirement for the gray, be gray beard of the flock, the older men. They are to be men of dignity and maturity in the church. Why is that so important for older men? Because they are leaders by nature in the church of God. Without being appointed to any leadership position, if you've been in the church, you have grown in the church, and you have matured, and you have gained respect from the members, you are a leader. In the church of God. For those who are in sinking 60s and aching 80s. Listen to this. Moses and Aaron were chosen by God to lead the Israelites out of Egypt in their 80s. Exodus 7 verse 7 says. Now Moses was 80 years old. And Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. They were old. And Philemon 1 verse 9b, talking about himself, the apostle Paul says, I, Paul, an old man. He is in prison for preaching the gospel in old age. Because there is no retirement allowed in the church of God. Older men are to set the tone of the congregation by their dignified manner of conduct and maturity. They understand their responsibilities and duties to pass the gospel or to get the next generation into the church of God. Therefore, they will compromise their preferences for the greater good of the church. That's maturity. If there is a struggle in the church of God today which caused the church not to progress, is for me as I'm growing old, to be set in my ways on such a way that I'm not flexible to be open to welcome other people. I'm not flexible to compromise to my preferences, whatever that might be, for the greater good of the church. That kills the church. If our church is not flexible to modernize our music, if our church is not flexible to welcome and, and embrace new songs, we're not going to be able to bring in younger people. They don't think like us. The next generation will come with a different way of doing church. And the responsibility will be of those who will be in the church then to adjust and to be flexible so that the church of God continues. We have responsibility, congregation, to bring in the next generation in the church. And we are to be mature enough to compromise our preferences to bring the next generation so that when we're gone, the work goes on. Senior men are leaders in the church of God. They understand their responsibility and they are flexible in their approach of doing ministry. The second group that Titus must address is the older women. Listen to what verse 3 to 4 says. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the younger women to love their husbands and children. 
That's the job description right there. It's not me who want who expect you to do that as your as your pastor is God in his church. He's laying out the rules. You old, this is your responsibility. You young, this is your responsibility. Everybody else who's part of the church of God has the responsibility and each of us are accountable to God. In verse 3, likewise, older women must be reverent in behavior, meaning to behave like a holy person, like priestesses. In dressing, in speech, in conduct, older women of the church are to reflect their holy calling as they live for God. To be able to teach someone, you need to command respect in the way you carry yourself. I said last Sunday, I was preaching here, I said, if I will say here in the pulpit, you know, I've got a lot of friends who are thugs. There's some good thugs, congregation. You need to be open-minded to those thugs. There's some good friends that I have who are killers. And I hang out with them. And we need to be open-minded about them. You will think that there is something wrong with me. And I think I, I will be correct to say that you will think twice to come to this service if I was preaching. Why are you working your way to get rid of me? And rightly so. Yes, we do love thugs for Christ. We don't hang around with them. We do love murderers to be saved. We don't hang around with them. So there has to be a manner in which I conduct myself so that I can be able to be of an influence to someone else. If I cannot teach myself to live in a manner that honors God, I've got no business to try to teach the next person. So the Bible says here, older women... They have responsibility. But before they can carry out that responsibility like older men, they need to carry themselves in a manner that is befitting to the gospel. They must not be slanderers or backbiters. The the, the correct word there is diabolos, which simply means a false accuser. A term used for the devil. Who who is the who is the accuser of the children of God? This term is used to describe a person who falsely accuses and divides people for no reasons. They must not be enslaved to much wine. Meaning that they must not be habitual drunkards. The reason being that they are to guard what comes into their mouth and goes out from their mouth. Because they are to be teachers of good things. That's the job of older women. It's interesting that... (laughs) God knows us very well. He's he's, he's not saying to to old men they must not be slanderers. I don't know. But when it comes to women, because women, especially in the culture of Crete, they were known for that. All the time. That kind of behavior must change because it's very destructive in the congregation. It's very destructive in the community of God. 
Let me give you two biblical examples of women. Sarah. Genesis 12 verse 11 tells us that Sarah, in her sinking 60s, she was so beautiful in appearance. Have you ever wondered how did she manage to do that? <laughs> Every time I read this, I ask myself, did she, did she, did she do not have a neck in your 60, 60s to be beautiful in such a way that kings cannot resist you? She drove crazy Pharaoh and Amalek. The Bible tells us in Genesis 12 verse 10 to 20 and chapter 20 verse 1 to 7. They couldn't resist her. And Abraham knew that she was beautiful. And if people knew that she was his wife, they were going to kill him for her. And so she lied. he lied many times. He went to Egypt and lied and said, you, you, we must say you my sister. And Pharaoh so took her. Amen. And God intervened and Abimelech did the same thing. And God intervened. Why? What was her secret? Guys, you're going to love me for this. I'm expecting a big amen from you. 1 Peter 3 verse 1 to 6 gives us two secrets of Sarah. Number one, the Bible says she adorned herself with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, not makeups. A gentle and quiet spirit. Number two, She trusted in God and she was submissive to her husband. 1 Peter 3 verse 5 to 6. And the man of the chair said, Amen to that. Come on, man. Amen to that. (laughs) She trusted God and she was submissive to her own husband. That word submission submission is a beautiful word. You ought to love it if you are a woman of God. It simply means to allow your husband to make you beautiful. That's what it means. Where do I get that? I get that because that's what is happening between my relationship with Jesus The more I submit to Christ, the more beautiful he makes me. That's how it works. So women are called to submit to their husband just like as the church submit to Christ. I'm not forced to submit to Christ. I submit to Christ because Christ loves me. You submit, you are to submit to your husband because your husband should be loving you. In such a way that there is nothing else you would rather do except submitting to her, making you to make for her, for him to make you beautiful for himself. That's what Jesus does with the church. He makes the church beautiful, making it holy, sanctifying it by the word, so that he can present to himself a beautiful bride without wrinkles. So that's what we should be doing. I should be making my wife beautiful. For who? For me. So I can present her to myself. Beautiful. So submission is a beautiful word. But the world doesn't want you to understand it that way. The second example for older women is Anna. When she was... Anna, when she was over 100 years old, Luke 2, verse 36 to 38, tells us that she served God in the temple with fasting and prayer night and days. And she did not hesitate to tell people about the good news of God. She used her widowhood 
to serve God and others. Again, no retirement allowed in the church of God. That that group that Titus is to address is younger women. Younger women. Listen to what verse 3b to 5 says. They are talking about the older women. They are to, to teach what is good. And verse 4. And so train the younger women to love their husbands and children. To be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands. That the word of God may not be reviled. So, so the younger women, I don't know if you, if you are a young wife, I don't know if you, you, you knew that you need training. <laughs> they are to be trained by older women of the church. What? To love their husband. You need to be trained to love your husband and your children. It's there in verse 4. And this is not much of the love of emotion and romance, but rather the sacrificial love of service. They need to be trained. They are to be self-controlled, pure, and without evil, homemakers, kind, submissive to their own husbands. That required training. Did you saw the reason why? They saw that the word of God won't be reviled or blasphemed. Our conduct defile or beautify the gospel. The way we carry ourselves as Christian does those things. It makes the gospel attractive when we conduct ourselves according to the word of God in our various groups in the church of God. It's getting hard even even here. I feel like taking off the jacket. (laughs) That's what the Bible does. The fourth group that Titus must address is the younger man. He simply says in verse 6, Likewise, urge the younger man to be self-controlled. To be self-controlled. To conduct themselves in a disciplined manner in their freedom. It's interesting that each group has to be a pattern for the whole congregation, even young people. Younger men are also to set a pattern in their kind of speech they use. To be young is not an excuse. If you are a Christian, young person, you need to conduct yourself in a manner that is in line with the gospel. When young people cause riot, we say, simply say, ah, they're just being young. They're not being young. They're just being stupid and rude. When they do not stand up for older men, even in the bus or train, we just say, oh, it's just young people for today. It's because they are not trained. We don't train them. Everything begins in the home. It's not going to happen in our community if in our home young people are not trained. So being young is not an excuse of loose conduct or careless speech. On the contrary, young men are to set the pattern, a model of all Christian or for all Christians in the church. You're asking me where I get that? 
I'm glad you asked. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 12 says, Let no one, Paul is talking to Timothy, despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith and purity. Set them a model. Be an example. So what is Paul's asking T- Titus to do here? He's simply saying to Titus, Titus, teach the congregations in the island of Crete, of Crete, sorry, to be exemplar in their various groups from old to young. And John Stott, in his book entitled The Message of First Timothy and Titus, gives us three valuable lessons that we can learn from verse 6 here. Number one, he says self-mastery is possible even in young men since there would be no point in exhorting to an impossibility. And number two, Encouragement is an appropriate means to secure such self-control, especially if it is the sympathetic, supportive exhortation of one young man to another within the solidarity of the Christian brotherhood. And thirdly, he says, such an encouragement must be accompanied by a consistent example, which is exactly what Paul comes to next as he exhorts Titus to model everything that is teaching. Listen to what chapter 2 verse 7 to 8 says. Paul says to Titus, show yourself in all respect to be a model of good works and in your teaching show integrity, dignity and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame having nothing evil to say about us. In my conduct there is us. How I carry myself out there. There is all of us here. I'm representing you. Whether I'm young or I'm old. How I talk out there. There is us. That's what Paul is saying to Titus. You need to model what you teach him. So that those who oppose the gospel may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say, not about you, Titus, but about us. We need to bring back that mentality of us in the church of God. Individualistic kind of thinking does not fit in into the Bible. We are a community. We are a members of one body. If one member suffers, the whole body suffers. If we understand that, we cannot even be comparing ourselves with others. If we understand that, we wouldn't be jealous of other people. If we understand that, we wouldn't be fighting. Fight comes from immaturity, not understanding of who we are. The Bible Paint different pictures which are very vivid to help us to understand we are like members of one body. And our job is to manifest Christ. We work together as members. We understand that you need me as different as we are, 
That's why God made us different so that we can knit one another. My body cannot survive if all my members were just a a hand. I wouldn't be able to speak. My hand is not like my eye or my ear. It's different. And the job of the members of my body is to manifest me. And you. And that is our duty, dear friend. So there is us. So in all things, Titus is to model, to be a model of good works and good conduct. He needs to show himself in doctrine, integrity, dignity, and incorruptibility. The way he handles the Bible. So that opponent might be put to shame. So that's a call to all of us, dear friends. If you bear the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are called, each of us, to be a pattern of good works and good conduct. Because that makes the gospel attractive. There are three things you need, I need, to be a model of good works and conduct. Number one, I need to be born again. I need to to repent of my sin and to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. John 1 verse 11 to 13 says, he came, talking about Jesus, he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Some they didn't receive him, those who received him, he gave them right to be called children of God. We are all born sinners separated from God because of our sin deserving God's righteous judgment. And Jesus came for three reasons. To live the life that we couldn't live and to die the death that we should have died to give us life that we need to be accepted by God. And he has done that. Number two, you need to get to know God personally. You need to get to know God personally. Listen to what John 17 verse 3 says. Jesus is praying before he went back to heaven. Praying for believers. He says, and this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God. And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is knowing God personally. You're not going to get it by just confessing God. That confession is to be followed by an intent to study, to know God personally. And how do you do that? Studying the Bible and coming to church and going to Bible studies without the the intention of doing what you're learning can only lead you to know about God, not to know him personally. Religious people, they knew the Bible. They knew about God. Pharisees, they knew about God. But they were not committed on to on to doing the word of God. They didn't know him personally. So when he came in the person of Jesus Christ, they rejected him. You need to study the Bible. It's a resolution that you need to make for yourself with a commitment to do what it says. Come to church 
knowing that the Bible's going to be open, it's going to be preached and taught. Go to Bible studies knowing that the Bible's going to be open and it's going to be faithfully taught. If it's not faithfully taught, tell us. Go to these things with one intention to do what God says. Where do I get that? John 14 verse 23. Jesus is talking here. If anyone loves me, that's how God understands love. He says he will keep my word. And my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. That's how you get to know God personally. It's when he comes into your life and make home in your life. And that happens when you keep his word, when you do his word. It's the warning that James gives us that we must not be just hearers of the Bible, but the doers of it. It doesn't help to hear the word, to gather information without doing it. There are many people who are walking libraries of the Bible with a crooked life. They're not saved. Don't fool yourself that you're saved if you're not obedient. Don't. You don't know God personally. God will never be real to you. So why should you bother yourself doing whatever he says? You're not going to bother But if God is real, he is as awesome as he is to you. You don't need encouragement to obey him. You need to repent and receive Jesus. And you need to commit yourself into knowing him personally. Personally. Number three, you need to die to self in order to live for him. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14 to 15 talking about the death of Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul says we have concluded this that one has died for all. Therefore all have died. Underline that. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live For themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. So the reason why Jesus died, says Paul, was to start a band of followers who would die to self and live for him. And Jesus says in Luke 9, talking about people who will Think about following him. People who will think about believing in him. Luke 9 verse 23 to 24. Jesus says. If anyone would come after me. Let him deny himself. Die to self. And take up his cross daily. And follow me. For whoever would save his life. Will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. There it is. It's clear as the sunrise. You want to follow me, say Jesus? Decide in your mind that you prepare to die to self. Most of the conflict that you have with people, whether in marriage or in any form of relationship, Even in the church, go home, look at the mirror. The problem is that is in that person that you're going to see in the mirror. You shouldn't be in the position of causing me to do something sinful. The only thing you do You just press the button to expose what is in my heart. 
the problem is with me, is with you. Not with other people. We bought in into this notion of our forefathers, for, for parents, Adam and Eve, of blaming other people with the problem that is in us. Until I acknowledge that I have a problem of sin in me that causes me to destroy relationships, I will never change. Change start by acknowledging the problem. So in order to adorn the doctrine of our God and Savior by good works and good conduct as Christians, as those whom the grace of God has been revealed, the grace that he talks about, as we will hear next week, The grace that he he talks about and he says, the grace of God has been revealed and it teaches us to say no to ungodliness. As those people, we are called to adorn the the doctrine of our God and Savior by our good works and conduct. So we must repent of our sin and and, and receive Jesus as Lord. We must know God personally. Not just knowing about God. And we must be prepared to die to self. Take up your cross daily and pray to God to help you. To die to yourself. Otherwise you're going to die as a miserable Christian. Saving self. We are meant to serve the Lord. By saving one another. But if we do not kill. King self. He takes the place of God. Let's bow our head in prayer. Father God we thank you. And praise you for your word. As confronting to each and every one of us as it, as, as, as it is. Give us grace, Lord. To receive it as the word of God. And give us willingness to obey it. And to do what you're instructing us to do. To adorn the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that that grace will be given to each of us. In fact, that grace has already been given to each of us. Help us to take that grace and to commit ourselves to living in a manner that adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior. For the glory of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.